taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Robert Black Smelly Bob Robert Black had been unloved from almost the minute he was born on the 21st of April, 1947. His mother hadn't planned for the pregnancy and wasn't prepared to face the stigma that being an unmarried mother brought in those days. So, having already refused to name her baby's father on the birth certificate, she gave up her baby boy for adoption after six months. Soon she would be long gone, married and living in Australia where she had four children, none of whom was told about the half-brother they had back in the old country, Scotland. Meanwhile, the boy was christened Robert and was fostered out to the Tulip family, who lived in the town of Canlicliven, in the West Highlands. He would spend the next 11 years of his life there. The time would be short with his foster family however, as his foster father Jack, died when Robert was only five, then his foster mother, Margaret, also passed away when he was just 11. Apparently during those years, Life was no bed of roses for Robert. Friends and neighbors remember him being covered in bruises, and he was often beaten with a leather belt when he misbehaved. To his peers he was known as Smelly Robert, due to a problem with body odor that remained with him throughout his life. Early reports suggest that Robert Black had been an aggressive lad, who did not mix well with children his own age preferring instead to hang around with a gang of younger kids that he could boss about. He was a bully and one friend recalls a particularly savage beating he gave for no reason at all, to a boy with an artificial leg. However, it should be noted, that during this time he never got into any really serious trouble. One peculiarity that Black did confess to after his eventual arrest, which had started during his youth, was an unnational fixation with his anus and his urge to see what he could fit in it. He said that he would put a little piece of metal up there, but photographs recovered following his arrest, show him with such items as a telephone handset and a table leg inserted. When his foster parent, Margaret Tulip, died in 1958, Black was sent to a children's home near Falkirk, and a year later at the age of only 12, he made his first attempt at trape. He and a couple of other boys from the home took a girl into a field, lifted her skirt, and tried to rape her. When the girl informed on the boys, it was decided that Robert Black needed a home with stricter discipline. He was sent to the all-male Red House Children's Home near Musselburg, on Scotland's east coast. Unfortunately, he became the subject of repeated sexual abuse by a member of staff. Aged 15, Robert Black left the Red House, with local authorities finding a job for him as a delivery boy, while he lived in a rented room in Greenock, Glasgow. It was while doing his deliveries that he began to live out some of his fantasies, molesting around 40 girls as he did his rounds. Incredibly, no one reported him until a year later, when he was convicted for lewd and libidinous behavior. When Robert Black was 17, he met a seven-year-old girl in a park and asked if she would like to go with him to see some kittens. He then led her to a disused building, where he held her down by the throat until she was unconscious and removed her underwear. Black then sexually assaulted her and masturbated over her unconscious body. When Black left, he had no idea if she was alive or dead and neither did he care. She was later found wandering in the street, distraught and bleeding. Astonishingly, even though he was caught, Black was merely admonished for this act, the psychiatric report suggesting that this was no more than an isolated incident. Still, social services sent him back to his hometown of Grangemouth hoping that he would make a fresh start to his already troubled life. Robert Black then found a job with a builder's supply company and seemed to settle down. He even had a relationship with a woman, Pamela Hodgson, which looked as if it might result in marriage. Soon however, rumors about his sexual predilections began to circulate and Pamela ended it. The problem was, they were more than just rumors. 
Black had been up to his old disgusting tricks again with the nine-year-old daughter of his landlord and landlady. They didn't to involve the police however, as they didn't want to put their daughter through the ignominy of an investigation, but word soon got out amongst the community and Black lost his job. He then returned to Ken McLevin, renting a room in a house. Unfortunately, there was a seven-year-old girl also living in the house, and Black was soon caught molesting her. The police were called this time and in March of 1967, Robert Black was sent to Borstal at Polmont for indecent assault. Upon his release, the depraved pedophile decided to head for the anonymity of the big city and moved to London. There he managed to stay out of trouble throughout the 1970s, but fueled his sexual urges instead, with child pornography magazines. He also used his time working as a swimming pool attendant, to watch little girls as they swam. It was around this time that he would break into the swimming pool and perform his weird swimming ritual with a broom handle. It was a very strange and perturbing sight. Black would swim up and down the pool with a broom handle protruding from his anus, where he had earlier inserted it. By day he worked as a lifeguard, and at night he broke in and swam. Black also began taking an interest in photography, but his snaps and videos were only of little girls. Around this time he was reported for touching a little girl again, but the police did not pursue the case. In 1976, Robert Black found work as a driver for a company called Poster Dispatch and Storage, delivering posters to depots all over the country. Being a loner he loved the job, as it allowed him to be on his own all day and to keep to his own schedule. For 10 years he worked for the company, frequently doing the longer runs for other drivers who did not like to be away from home for so long. What they did not know however, was that in the back of Black's van, were various masturbatory implements that he would insert into his anus. Sometimes he would dress up in female children's clothing or swimming costumes in the back of the van, while he fantasized about touching little girls. Black's first murder came one hot summer's afternoon, in July of 1982. 11-year-old Susan Maxwell lived in a farmhouse just outside the town of cornhill on tweed on the English side of the border. She had gone to play tennis with a friend in Coldstream, just on the other side of the border. When her mother went to collect her after the game, she was nowhere to be found. A phone call to her friend confirmed that she had left to walk home, in which case her mother should have passed her on the road. The police were called and it emerged that Susan, dressed in bright yellow and holding a tennis racket, had been seen by a number of people until she crossed the bridge over the River Tweed, at which point she seemed to have vanished. Two weeks later, Susan Maxwell's body was discovered in a ditch beside a lay-by on the A518 at Loxley, near Uxeter. she was 250 miles from her home. She had been there a while and her body had badly decomposed in the summer heat. Investigators identified her from her dental records, but it was difficult to conclude how she had died. Her underpants had been removed and folded beneath her head, and her shorts had been replaced. There was no doubt to detectives, that however she had died, the motive for the attack was sexual. The investigation into Susan Maxwell's death lasted for a year but came to no conclusion in spite of 500,000 handwritten index cards that had been compiled. It was the days before computer databases, which have made crime fighting much less time consuming. Robert Black's next murder would be on the 8th of July, 1983, in his old haunt of Portobello, a seaside resort just outside Edinburgh. Five-year-old Carolyn Hogg, had attended a party that day and had gone out to play before bedtime. The playground was only a few minutes away and her mother had seen no harm in letting her daughter play out for five minutes. When fifteen minutes had passed and Carolyn had not returned, her mother sent her brother out to find her. When he came back saying there was no trace of her, panic set in and the police were called. 
they immediately established that Carolyn had been seen by numerous people holding hands with what was described as a scruffy man. The scruffy man had taken her to a nearby fairground called Fun City, where he had paid for her to go on a ride. They were last seen walking out of the entrance, still holding hands. The largest ever search in Scotland was instigated, and her parents spoke to the press, with her mother weeping as she explained how much she missed her beloved daughter. They found Carolyn Hogg's body on the 18th of July, in a lay-by at Twygross in Leicestershire, close to a busy road. She was 300 miles from home, but within just 24 miles of the location of Susan Maxwell's body. She was identified from her hairband and a locket, and this time the body was completely naked. The police, naturally, linked the two cases and the deputy chief constable of Northumbria, Hector Clark, was put in overall charge of the joint operation, which now involved a number of police forces. Clark set about bringing the case into modernity and computerized all the data gathered thus far. The police had learned from the Yorkshire Ripper investigation, just how valuable computers could be in the hunt for a murderer. They then interviewed witnesses and made house-to-house -house inquiries, and sat for weeks on the road where the body was discovered, taking down registration numbers of passing cars and checking them out. Police forces all over the country were asked to provide the names of possible suspects and holidaymakers from around the world sent on rolls of film taken at Portobello on the night in question. T. Unfortunately, even with so much manpower, they found nothing. There was a gap of three years before Black's next murder of an innocent. On the 26th of March, 1986, 10-year-old Sarah Harper went to a local shop for a loaf of bread, and never returned to her home in Morley in Leeds. Within an hour the police were called and an intensive search was launched, though it wouldn't be successful. Her body was found on the 19th of April, by a man walking his dog next to the River Trent in Nottingham. It was estimated that she had probably been dumped in the river from a junction off the motorway, likely while she was still alive. Her injuries were described by investigators as, terrible. At first, Detectives investigating the Harper case, thought that there was no link between her and the Maxwell and Hogg killings. There were differences, Susan and Carolyn had been much younger than Sarah and had been dressed in bright summer clothes. They had also both been taken near main roads, whereas Morley was out of the way, and you did not go there without a reason. However, there were also similarities between the three abductions and murders. All three were abducted for sexual purposes and driven south to the Midlands, where their bodies were dumped. Although Sarah's injuries were more extreme than the others, usually the offender tends to escalate the violence he perpetrates as time goes by, the more murders he or she commits, then the more confident he or she becomes. In July of 1990, Robert Black was finally caught. Six-year-old Mandy Wilson was walking to a friend's house in the village of Snow, in the Scottish borders, when a neighbor, David Rookies, watched her walk past as he cut his grass. He later explained that as he bent down to look at the blades of his lawnmower, he noticed her feet standing next to a man's. He then said, Suddenly they vanished, and I saw him making movements as if he were trying to stuff something under the dashboard. He got into the van, reversed up the driveway the child had just come from and sped off towards Edinburgh. Turkeys quickly memorized the car's registration as it disappeared, and ran indoors to call the police. The number was radioed out to every police car in the vicinity, but as he stood explaining what had happened to a police officer, Robert Black's van suddenly appeared again. The policeman ran into the road and the car swerved to avoid him before stopping. The officers then dragged Robert Black out of the vehicle and handcuffed him. In the back of the van they found a little girl, wrapped in a sleeping bag with tape over her mouth to prevent her calling out. When questioned about the girl in the back of his van, Black displayed the true characteristics of a psychopath. 
he was completely disassociated from her, stating. I wasn't thinking about her at all. Like, you know, what she must be feeling. If she had died, it would have been a pure accident. Robert Black was sentenced to life imprisonment for Mandy Wilson's abduction, and later received sentences of 35 years for the other murders. He will be eligible for parole in 2029, when he will be 82 years of age. It is thought that Black might be responsible for a great many more murders of little girls, such as the unsolved killing of 13-year-old Jeanette Tate, who disappeared in Devon in 1978. So far, he has not been willing to talk about these deaths.